we're delighted to have with us uh, Ambassador Max Bacchus. Uh, Ambassador Bacchus, uh, you wrapped down your uh, your tenure uh, and service as ambassador in 2017. Um, how would you say U.S.-China relations have evolved uh, since then, and what is the state of U.S.-China relations today? Well, first, Russell, thanks very much for the invitation, and thank you, Forbes, very much. Um, wish you all the success uh, for your conference. Um, well, obviously, the, the relationship's not good. It's terrible. Um, the um, And it's been going downhill virtually during the last maybe roughly uh, 10 years. I, it started a bit when I was there. I began 2013, left in 17. But then when President Trump got elected, America first, it just accelerated Americans, in a certain sense, isolationism, certainly being cut, cut off from China and demonizing China. And uh, President Biden really has enacted some of the same actions that President Trump did, namely um, sanctions and export control act provisions, uh, re restricting U.S. investors' investment in China, et cetera. So it's 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 not good. It's it's really not good at all. When I was there, 13 to 17, my gosh, lots of cabinet secretaries came over. I was able to meet with anybody I wanted to in the Chinese government. A lot of American businessmen came over. Uh, we in the embassy helped them. Some didn't want our help, but there's a lot more to and fro back then. It's it's not good at all right now. It's it's it, it's it's in bad shape. Mm. So the uh, the Biden administration has been working this year to increase the number of visits uh, by U.S. leaders uh, to China uh, after the uh, balloon brouhaha uh, earlier this year. Uh, what do you make of that approach? And what are your expectations from Commerce Secretary's uh, uh, the Commerce Secretary's visit to Beijing this week? Well, the trips, are, it's good. Um, and we've had several. Um, Secretary Biden, Secretary Yellen, Secretary, now Secretary Ramondo. And the other way, um, uh, Commerce Minister Wang Wentao has visited the United States. I think Ramondo just visited with him recently. All that's helpful. I mean, it helps to get talk to each other, helps to express each side's point of view and list the other. It's, obviously an opportunity to ask some questions, but I don't expect much out of it, frankly. Um, that is visits generally of late last year, and um, Secretary Ramondo was visited as, as wonderful as she is, and that's basically because the Chinese really see Americans as just doing a lot of talking, but they don't see the United States really acting positively, and some of the actions they do see from their perspective are not positive. For example, President Biden's executive order on, on investment. And I, I think they'll they'll be gracious hosts. Um, they won't be nasty or bitter or talk down to Secretary Raimondo. Mm -hmm. But um, I just don't think they're going to expect much out of it. And, and frankly, uh, a big problem is that balloon. And the problem with the balloon is it's visual. It's up in the sky. It's mm -hmm. passing over the United States, even over my home state of Montana. I mean, everybody wrote about it. Everybody took pictures of it. It's a big deal. It's a visual. Contrast that with um, talks. There's no, there's no visual there. It's just talking heads. Mm. It just, and it it's just doesn't really grab people. And, and as we all know uh, in life, generally, uh, negative news has more potency and currency than good news. And so, mm. oh my gosh, it just, oh, no pun, it overshadowed everything. And it's really hard to get that back. Um, mm. As you know, yeah, anti China sentiment in the Congress is, is not only bipartisan, I mean, it's, it's intense. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's that's not causing any 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 progress. Mm. So uh, so thinking about uh, D.C. and and state governments um, uh, all around the country, they have stepped up or are looking to step up uh, uh, rules uh, that would affect U.S.-China uh, commerce. Uh, how much of that do you think is good thing, and how much of that may not be? Well, so I, good? I, obviously, <clears throat> national security comes first. The strongest human instinct is self-preservation. National security comes first, and we must do whatever we can to protect that. And that means executive orders, actions by Congress, our agencies, etc. However, my concern is that um, um, the United States, as has China, have used national security as an overall umbrella um, to uh, protect local companies, protect them. Not just from security 
perspective, but from a commercial perspective, it's too broad. The umbrella is just too broad. Mm. And add to that, we don't ever get examples. Okay, we say, you know, our security is jeopardized. Well, show me. Where's the beef? Where's an mm. example? Now, I don't know. I know in security measures, in the security world, it's a little hard to get examples, but I think we should. Okay, China, here's a good example of what you've been doing. And, you know, don't forget, we spy on China, too. American press talks a lot about China spying on the U.S. They don't talk much about the U.S. spying on China, mm -hmm. as we do virtually every country around the world, as does China. So um, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> that actions by the U.S. government properly tailored and restricted are good. We talk about, you know, um, the United States, Jake Sullivan does, you know, small yard, high fence. Um, I think that's, that's pretty good. Trouble is, Chinese don't believe it. And mm. my other concern is, is state action, state governments. Mm. I mean, in my home state here in Montana, my gosh, we passed legislation to ban TikTok for everybody. Now, that's not going to go anywhere, but it passed the state legislature signed by the governor. In addition, measures to prohibit the state of, to require the state of Montana University system to report any contacts with China. Um, and add to that, we land restrictions, no, no Chinese land ownership uh, near military installation. The trouble is, um, if I were in Chinese shoes or anybody's shoes, U.S. investors' shoes, my gosh, you know, this is getting out of hand here. Every state's going his its own direction. They've got a federal government. Generally, foreign policy is under the auspices of the president. Um, that's what's happened historically. Uh, President Eisenhower walked to the Oval Office, see that big globe there, hey, I'm in charge of world world foreign policy. And ever since then, it's become more difficult for presidents to be sort of in charge of foreign policy because the world is so much more complicated, it's more commercial, internet, you name it. Um, mm. but it's very hard. I, I think the administration should try to figure out some ways to work with states so there's some cohesion, some coherence, not, not one state doing one thing, another state another. And, and it's, it's happening in part, that is all this all these actions by both the Congress and the state because of domestic politics in America. Yeah. Uh, domestic politics toward China is driven by anti-China sentiment. And it's very easy for anybody to be critical of China. There's no cost. There is no cost to any congressman or senator uh, or, or, or state legislator for criticizing China. There's no downside. So they do it to help get reelected. So let's stick with politics uh, for a minute next year, presidential election. How's China going to figure into the presidential election, and and what might that mean for business between the two countries next year? I think there'll be more China bashing um, by President Biden, by the Republican nominee, whoever he or she might be, uh, by members of Congress, uh, by the, the, the select committee, uh, headed up by Gary Gallagher. He's going to bash China more, clearly, mm -hmm. as will other members of Congress. It's, it's bipartisan. Um, um, but I think, frankly, the Chinese have become more sophisticated. Uh, they, they, can, they build that into their calculation of, of U.S. policy because they know that a lot of those statements in the U.S. are, um, are, are, are geared toward re-election and, and there's no cost, particularly no cost by, by any member of Congress to say anything negative about China. They're starting to, to recognize that. Uh, but still, there is a, is a cost. Because whenever you're being criticized, even though if you think you understand that the ulterior motives are benign, it, it doesn't help. It's, and what it does, all the criticism by Americans against China emboldens the hawks in China. It makes it very difficult um, for China to take a step uh, toward the United States. I, for the last oh, year, roughly more than a year, have urged both sides to take a positive unilateral action to show that you, you want this relationship to work. Don't look for a quid pro quo. Don't look for some kind of negotiated deal. Just something positive to show that you can do something here. The reaction I get from both sides is the same. When I mention that to the Chinese, every time, I, oh no, we can't do that. Uh, the hawks in China will just, just go nuts. When I mention mm -hmm. that to a, <clears throat> um, American uh, politicians, oh, we can't do that because it's just, it's just it's too toxic. To do yeah. that, it's, it's, so things are really stuck. It's, it's unfortunate. Hmm. Uh, you've said elsewhere uh, that uh, part of the difficulty in U.S.-China relations is that Americans, on the whole, uh, don't know China uh, well. So um, I've been reading up on the Bacchus Institute's uh, laudable uh, work, and uh, wanted to ask if I could. Uh, now, how is your Bacchus Institute 
working to address that gap. Well, uh, thanks, Russell. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud, <laughs> frankly. I'm not a megalomaniac. I got this sign behind me with my name in big letters. I've got to get it redesigned so that <laughs> my name is in smaller letters, but the institute is in much larger letters behind me. But we're working hard on the point you just made. But I might, before we get into that, say, I think still the real ballast here is business. Um, we, both countries need each other economically, commercially. We're joined at the hip, and that's not very well known. I mentioned $700 billion. Secretary Ramondo gave that same figure to, to day, or day before over in China. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's valid. And both countries want investment from the other. And there's a huge market for American businessmen. Now, clearly, American businessmen are trying to build in various uh, risks in different scenarios and how well they can do business in China. And clearly, the actions by China on the American consultancy firm is trying to get information in China. Uh, adverse actions are having a, a chilling effect. There's no question about all of that. But, but I do think, and I believe this very strongly, that because businessmen don't get involved in politics very much, the more business both ways can still try to work to, to, to do deals, keep working, building up those relationships, personal relationships, commercial relationships, the more it's gonna really help the relationship. Because if there were no strong commercial relationship today between US and China, man oh man, I just think that at the geopolitical level, we'd be in a real in a world of hurt. Um, one more point I'd like to make, maybe two more quickly, if I mind. And that is, um, I, I think that over time, it may not happen until after the 2024 20, election, that both countries are gonna realize that we, hey, we gotta work with each other. China's not going anywhere. It's gonna be here on this globe. America's not going anywhere. We're always gonna be here. Um, so that's it's not a really good uh, 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 metaphor, or, but the one I come up with, it's really an arranged marriage. We have an arranged marriage with China, arranged by the geopolitical economic forces of the world. The United States, biggest, strongest country so far, China, second largest so far. We're here, different systems, totally different, but we're not going away. And so like an arranged marriage, we gotta figure out how to accommodate each other. Um, and there are lots of ways we can accommodate, but it just isn't happening uh, because there's very little trust and there's very little trust because there's so little communication between the two countries and because each country likes to take, you know, crit pot shots or criticize the other. But I think the more we realize this is a like an arranged marriage, we don't love each other. Believe me, this is not a marriage based on love, but it, it, it is a marriage based on an arrangement by the geopolitical forces of the world, and there's no divorce. We're not getting, no country's gonna get off this planet. We're here. We gotta learn how to accommodate each other. And I think the more we realize, both countries start to realize that neither side talks down to the other, neither thinks it's superior to the other, neither wants to change the other, but to work to try to find some accommodation. That'll be a big, big plus. Answer your question, Russell, and that's a long answer, is that we are, <laughs> just today I interviewed somebody else to be an executive director for our organization. Uh, we sent 20 some. Montana students to China last month, they came back on fire. They mm. loved it. My goal is to get kids out of their comfort zone, out of, and get them overseas, get involved in service, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Mm. Well, thanks a lot for sharing uh, all that insight uh, with us uh, today. Look forward to having the chance to see you in person in the not too distant future. Yep, thanks Russell, and good luck everybody.